Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really pleased to introduce one of the most, no pressure, Dean, but one of the most popular speakers we've had at, uh, at this conference. Uh, this is, I think, the third time you've, you've been here, Dean. Uh, Dean is a senior researcher at the Heritage Foundation, and before that, he was at the Center for Naval Analysis, and he has a book called Cyber Dragon, and it focuses on China and their cyber activities. And I, I enjoyed it a lot, and I highly recommend it. I'm not going to take a moment more of his time. Here, here's Dean. You're on. Oh, one last thing about Dean. <laughs> Dean, and you can still find it, he's written the most lucid and cogent discussion of how China is using law, has weaponized law. And, it's the, and I hope you're going to have a few comments on that this afternoon, or whatever we are, this morning still. Uh, and it's mandatory reading for my students in my course. And I highly recommend you can get it on the, on the web during the Thank you, sir. Well, good morning. So, must be a large contingent of military folks here, because you folks actually respond to the salutation. Um, my comments today are going to uh, try and examine um, the growing challenge from China in both the military and non-military realms. And let me just start by noting that political warfare, which includes things like legal warfare, straddles that line. Because for China, this is both a military issue and a uh, broader national strategic effort. Um, let's begin by noting a couple of things. China does, in fact, pose a growing challenge to the United States. This is laid out in the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. Like Russia, China is seen as a major state seeking to alter the international system. One of the key things to keep in mind here is that Russia and China are very different, if for no other reason than the sheer access to resources. China is rich. China is the number two GDP in the world. Now, the Chinese don't necessarily think of themselves as rich, because when you have to spread each dollar gained in GDP across 1.3 billion people, it takes a lot of effort to raise everyone by just a dollar. Nonetheless, when you are the number two GDP in the world, when you are a nation state, when you are one of the P5, when you are a key part of global supply chains, you have access to a lot of different tools. The Chinese come at the world very differently than any other challenge this country has faced before. And this is for a number of reasons. To begin with, Asia is not Europe. What do I mean by that? Europe has always enjoyed a balance of power approach to international relations since, let's say, 1632 in the Treaty of Westphalia. Okay? The rise of France, Prussia, England, Spain inevitably led to coalitions of other great powers. So Napoleon faced a grand alliance, so did the Kaiser, so did Hitler, so did the Soviet Union. Asia has never had a balance of power across 5,000 years of history. There is no record of a Japanese-Vietnamese alliance to counter the Han Dynasty, or a Khmer-Korean coalition, like the alliteration, um, to counter even the Mongols. Instead, you had a middle kingdom, Zongguo, or central kingdom, same words, and a periphery of tributary states. They wouldn't necessarily consider it appeasement, but they would consider it a, not a balancing of China. And this is one of the reasons I would also suggest that China, for example, looks at alliances fundamentally differently than we do. We think of alliances as a source of strength. The Chinese see alliances as a coalition of countries where there are multiple seams that I can go after. And if I can take apart that alliance structure, you're weaker than you would have been before. The other aspect here, particularly uh, applicable to a school of law and a conference on law, is that Asia never developed a rule of law concept. 
there has been no independent judiciary. And again, we are not just talking about the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China. Throughout the history of imperial China, you did not have an independent judiciary that could hold in check the powers of the emperor. And in fact, the emperor appointed the prosecutors, the uh, magistrates, the various elements. And they were certainly not about to start calling into question whether the sovereign was engaging in legal or illegal activities. And this, in turn, has led to a very different view of the law, a much more instrumental view. It is ruled by law, not rule of law. And that, in turn, has implications about everything from governance within China to its behavior in international forums and the relevancy of international law. So let me talk now a little bit about the Chinese military security challenge to us. One of the key things to keep in mind is that the People's Liberation Army is not a national military. Those of you who have heard me speak before, I apologize for hearing me say this again, but that's because this is worth foot stomping. The PLA is the armed wing of the Chinese Communist Party. It is a party army. So for those of you who have taken an oath before, whether in uniform or out, what is it that you have sworn to protect, uphold, and defend? The Constitution of the United States. And China has a constitution. It's a very nice constitution. It guarantees all sorts of things. You know, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, etc. But the point is that the PLA, every officer in the PLA above the rank of second lieutenant, one is a member of the Chinese Communist Party, and they swear to uphold the rule of the CCP. That is their oath. That is their foremost responsibility. That's a very different starting point. Um, it also suggests that the PLA is under far firmer control of the party, in part because it is part of the party. As opposed, and so the concept of civil military divide, which animates so much of our discussion about how our military is governed, I would again suggest is very different in the Chinese context. The other thing to keep in mind is this is not your father's PLA. This is not a military that continues to believe that you will run out of bullets or AMRAMs or harpoons or uh, advanced cruise missiles before they run out of bodies. This is a military that has paid very close attention to other people's wars and has come to the conclusion that future wars will be determined by amount of technology, amount of capability measured in terms of sophisticated weaponry and access to information, as opposed to simply being able to put more bodies on the field. And we see this reflected in the multi-decade, multifaceted modernization effort that has characterized the Chinese military for the last 25 to 30 years. We have seen a rise in joint operations with a focus on high-tech warfare in the 1990s, followed by ever more integrated joint operations uh, and an emphasis on informationized warfare in the 2000s. We have seen the Chinese establish an idea of what future wars would look like and then change in doctrine, followed by acquisition, and finally organization. I mean, the idea that you would have some idea of where you want to be, start thinking about how you want to get there, and eventually buy things that support that, I mean, that's just crazy talk, right? I mean, you know, who, who does that? Well, apparently the Chinese do. Um, at the end of 2015, to speak of the organizational reforms, we saw the most far-reaching changes in the Chinese military since its founding in 1949. And that's a whole lecture in and of itself, but let me just cover some of the key high points here. We saw the reorganization of the Chinese Central Military Commission, which actually runs the PLA. Uh, only in China would you believe that you could go from four general departments to 15 departments, offices, and commissions and improve efficiency. Um, but that's how they view it. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects there is the shift from the general staff department to the joint staff department, underscoring again, Future wars, in the Chinese view, will be joint. And when they say joint, they mean operations not across services, although that's true, but across domains, land, sea, air, outer space, and the electromagnetic domain slash information space. We saw the creation of war zones to replace military regions, 
The military regions were always peacetime structures. They were going to morph in time of war, but there was no standing wartime command and control structure up until the end of 2015 when the Chinese military did this transition and stood up the five war zones, also sometimes translated as major theater commands. It's the same words in Chinese. Um, north, south, east, west, and central. And finally, most relevant here, was the creation of several new services, including the PLA Strategic Support Force. PLA Strategic Support Force brought together China's space capabilities, electronic warfare capabilities, and network warfare capabilities. Notice I said network, not cyber. Cyber is a small piece of the broader information slash network warfare capabilities. So this is really China's information warfare force. But one of the most interesting aspects here is that it also included a shift of base 311. Base 311 did not belong to the General Staff Department or the General Armaments Department. It belonged to the General Political Department. It is the facility that houses, officially, China's political warfare forces, the people who conduct, among other things, legal warfare, as well as psychological warfare and public opinion warfare. So they were moved to the PLA Strategic Support Force. Because for the Chinese, information warfare is not just, it's certainly not about just ones and zeros, bits and bytes. But it's also more than just bits and bytes and electronic warfare, like jamming of radios and radars and space. It is about influencing perceptions. Because information, bits and bytes, data, URLs, mean very little until two things happen. One, somebody actually reads it. And two, as important, somebody acts upon it. And acting upon something is not just a function of flipping a switch. It's a function of deciding whether to flip the switch and when to flip the switch. Right? So therefore, if I can influence the decision maker, maybe to hesitate, maybe to dilute, maybe to say no, that is every bit as much part of information warfare as hacking your website, turning off your email, or preventing you from being able to access a particular database. In the intervening years since 2016, we have seen the PLA modernize significantly. We've seen them modernize in the Navy. Um, in 2004, the Chinese basically laid out the PLA's new historic missions. Key domains were the maritime, outer space, and information space arenas. 16 years later, we see modernization in the maritime domain. We see a Chinese Navy that adds the equivalent of the Royal Navy every year. That's actually not so impressive given the size of the Royal Navy, but still, it's something worth thinking about. Um, they have one of the youngest fleets out there. Uh, we see improvements in space capabilities. China, of course, has landed on the far side of the moon. China is probably the second biggest space power out there in terms of satellite launches, satellite capacity. Uh, you heard a lot of folks, uh, well, sorry, not a lot. You heard uh, one of the professors talk about space law. Believe me, the Chinese are very active in thinking about how to control and dominate space. And finally, again, the information space domain. Uh, if you go online, you can see the 2019 um, PLA review. Uh, it was very impressive, lots of new tanks, lots of new UAVs, et cetera. Pay attention to the Air Force flyby. Beautiful array, Chinese jets all putting out you know, multicolored smoke. It was led not by a J-20 stealth fighter, not by a J-31 stealth fighter. It was led by an AWACS, a Chinese manufactured AWACS. Because this is a political message, both internally and externally. We can produce very high-end information platforms that will be the force multiplier for the next conflict, that will send those planes to the right place, the same way that Chain Home and Chain Home Low stations directed the RAF in the Battle of Britain. 
What you probably didn't see much of, because it's hard to demonstrate, is political warfare platforms, although you did see UAVs in the electronic warfare capacities. For the Chinese, political warfare straddles the line of military and non-military. Think of it as the hardest form of soft power. And here in particular is the role of legal warfare. Because we see this along with public opinion warfare in action all the time. Public opinion warfare in the Chinese view is underway all the time. It is what shapes other people's perceptions of both China and everybody else. And so this is why the Chinese reacted so very strongly when United Airlines, American, and Delta cut off flights to China. Because this suggested that China and coronavirus were a problem. And what kind of nonsense is that? Because that is slandering China. Why did three Wall Street Journal journalists get booted out of China? Because Walter Russell Mead published an op-ed calling China the sick man of Asia, a phrase that was current almost exactly 100 years ago during the century of humiliation, when China was weak and exploited. More specifically these days, we see, for example, as I said earlier, about rule bylaws. So in the South China Sea, we see China basically saying that the nine dash line should be respected as China's de facto borders, that everything within it really should be seen as China's sovereign waters. But, because it's rule bylaw, right? So I have one set of rules for me and one set of rules for you. Russia should reconsider whether the northern sea route is Russian territory. Because really, that's an international waterway. And that means everyone, including China, should have some voice in how that's managed. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is we think of China and Russia as being very advanced in engaging in hybrid warfare, legal warfare being an example. But from the Chinese perspective, we're the problem. Right? We're the ones who use the law to justify our actions. Why does the US sell arms to Taiwan? Well, we passed the Taiwan Relations Act. That's not even a treaty. That's a law. But our law says we're supposed to help Taiwan be able to defend itself. So therefore, we have no choice. Oh, sure, sure you don't. Um, we have used the law to indict Chinese military officers for engaging in cyber espionage. Uh, we have now declared Chinese media as foreign missions and therefore subject to essentially controls typically associated with diplomatic representation. All of these are you know, things that from the Chinese perspective are every bit as much legal warfare as what they engage in. Um, where I would suggest the Chinese are more effective than we are is often in the ability to exploit their economic and political power as opposed to their military power to further China's efforts to grow its capabilities across military and non-military aspects. And we see this, for example, in the Belt and Road Initiative, which is a major Chinese investment effort across Central Asia, Africa, and sometimes into South America, where we see a combination of economic development, creation of industrial standards, and political inroads all being pushed in a fairly coordinated fashion. But the uh, focus here isn't to counter the US. We are very egotistical. It's always about us, right? Why, why does anyone do anything? No leaf falls, no sparrow flies, unless it affects the United States. Um, from China's perspective, they are building their comprehensive national power, which covers economic, military, science and technology, diplomatic, political, and even cultural security, to improve themselves to build themselves up. And they would be doing this whether we were the top dog, or the Russians were the top dog, or the Europeans were the top dog. And they are doing this in no small part because they have seen what happens when your comprehensive national power isn't very effective, such as during the so-called century of humiliation. Now, where this directly affects current day-to-day -day things is the role of information. From the CCP's perspective, the Chinese Communist Party's perspective, we have shifted from the industrial age to the information age. The currency of international power has evolved. It used to be, how many tons of shipping did you produce? How many tons of bauxite did you smelt? How many tons of steel did you produce? Those things still matter. But what matters even more is your ability to generate information, analyze information, that human factor, to exploit information, to transmit information accurately and rapidly, and do so ahead of 
your competitors, and your adversaries. That's what it means to live in the information age. It affects your economy, it affects your politics, it affects your military. It's why we see the Chinese focusing on building information and communication technologies, including the so-called ABC, artificial intelligence, big data, cloud computing. It's why China is very proud of the fact that it has two of the five fastest supercomputers in the world, and why Made in China 2025 highlighted, among other things, information technologies. It also, again, this emphasis on the information age and information as power is reflected in Chinese behavior in the cyber realm, which is, from our view, at a minimum a violation of norms, if not an outright violation of the law. Okay. Um, there was a very good article, and I commend it to folks, um, in I believe it's called the Journal of Military Cyber. Um, it is written by two professors, uh, Chris Demchak, D-E-M-C-H-A-K, at the U.S. Naval War College, and Yuval Shavit at Tel Aviv University. What it highlights is that China has regularly redirected portions of the global internet to China. It has done so at a technical level. It basically did the equivalent of using its position around the world to redirect Imagine if you had air traffic controllers in Paris, Tokyo, and New York who were able to redirect air traffic to China. Okay? Didn't matter where they were coming from and going to. It just would automatically redirect traffic to China. And when the planes landed in China temporarily, they would sort of go on board, rifle through everybody's luggage, and then send them on their way. This is, in a very, very gross manner, what the Chinese have been doing on the internet. By using positions in Europe and North America, they have redirected global internet traffic to China repeatedly. Okay. Is this illegal? It's a good question. You know, you know, I'm not, uh, I should have said this at the very beginning. This is very dangerous. I, I apologize. Sir. Um, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> I never went to law school. My closest thing to law was probably watching the paper chase. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I have no opinion on whether this is legal or illegal because I'm not qualified. But it does certainly violate the norms of how the internet is supposed to operate, which is to move data rapidly from point of generation to point of reception. And the Chinese have used their position as part of that top layer of internet providers to say, you know what, that's dumb. I have this ability, I'm going to use it. So this is the kind of approach to the law, whether it is formal commercial law, whether it is norms, whether it is what have you, to basically justify, to basically try and build Chinese access to information. As you can imagine, I would, su I would suggest this has implications for things like 5G and Huawei, because the Chinese have gone to the trouble of passing a number of laws in the Chinese domestic context that also say that every corporation and individual is and can be required to hand over information to the government on demand. Now, Huawei says, well, we would never do that. And my question to that is, and how long do you expect to stay out of jail if the Chinese government says we have laws on the books that say we can't? Uh, let me conclude here um, by noting uh, the following points. One, China poses a fundamentally different challenge than any previous power. It poses that challenge, obviously, in the military sense, but also not so much in ideology. China is not trying to remake the world in its own image. But in terms of norms and rules and rulemaking establishments, it comes from a different starting point. It's trying to go to a different place. China is not a rising power. China is a returning power. That's a very different perspective. It is trying to reclaim what it believes has always been its property, the South China Sea and Taiwan but also its position, 
preeminent power in Asia, a great power, a dominant power, and a key battleground for the U.S.-China competition is the realm of information. And again, not just the technology, but how information is interpreted and exploited and acted upon. Um, thank you all very much for taking time out of lunch and all that. And, uh, Dean has very kindly agreed to answer some okay. questions. Um, I'm going to open it up to the audience before I ask Olivia what her question is. <laughs> sir, right there. Let's wait till we get a microphone up there so our friends in the overflow room can, can hear the question. Hi, I'm Adam Rodriguez from Carolina Law. You mentioned China routing information through China through the internet and war information is maybe the primary battleground with them. Are there ways that you see the U.S. working back against that? I know we indicted the five members of the Army, but ways in the information field that we're trying to, to compete with what they're doing. So with regards to the Border Gateway Protocol, BGP manipulation, it's not clear what anyone can do short of basically saying that China Telecom, you have abused the rights and privileges accorded you of being at this level, and we are going to shut you down out of your points of presence in North America, and ideally with the Europeans doing the same thing in Europe. In my opinion, I think that the Chinese have behaved sufficiently badly to justify that. Um, I'm not sure the extent to which the Chinese would necessarily care. Obviously, it would shut down a key route. The flip side is Verizon or Vodafone may lose its access to China. Imbalance with the Chinese mind not so clear. You have the Great Firewall of China whose whole purpose is to limit foreign access into China. With regards to the, uh, you know, so what about indicting Chinese military officers, Ministry of State Security people, et cetera? Um, one, as long as you recognize that these people were never going to come out of China anyway, and so you were never actually going to arrest these people. So the more interesting part, in my opinion, has actually been the administration's decision to charge Huawei with RICO, uh, racketeering charges. Um, again, let me disclaim any legal references here. This is all based on law and order. Um, <laughs> but my understanding is that under racketeering charges, it is not only the specific criminals, but there are potentially larger sets of gains that could be on the chopping block. So. If you are being prosecuted under RICO, it's not just you being a bad person, but potentially your two nice houses, your four cars, including the new Lamborghini, uh, your daughter's pony, all of those could be potentially seized. What this does, in my opinion, to Huawei North American executives is it puts them in the position of now working for us rather than for China, which is to say, I, as a Huawei North American executive, am not prepared to have my cars, especially my new Lamborghini, um, my houses, or my daughter's pony repossessed. So I'm going to now be incentivized to go to Huawei back in China and say, now you guys are sure this technology wasn't stolen, right? And I really want to have documentation to show that it wasn't stolen, because my daughter's pony ain't up for grabs. So it changes the incentive net structures for at least the foreign executives who work for a place like Huawei, or ZTE, or Sinopec, or any of these other places. Um, so my hope is that that will have an effect. But this literally just came down the last few weeks, so we'll, it's far too early to tell. Allie, what was your question? Uh, my question is also who, about who are you? Oh, do you need a microphone? Yes. Um, Alan Remsen, I'm a 2L at Georgetown Law. Uh, my question is also about Huawei. And what do you think the impact on the special relationship between the United States and the UK will be if the UK does, in fact, um, have a limited um, implementation of Huawei 5G technology? So let me start by questioning whether you can have a limited impact. 
Um, in the context of 5G, which it should be noted, nobody has actually rolled out a full-blown 5G network yet. The argument is that the separation between core and periphery goes away. The amount of data that's going to just slosh through the system because you've increased the bandwidth, thanks to 5G, means that your cell phone is no longer just a cool place to watch a great movie on a two-inch screen, but will download it faster, yay, um, but two, will also be part of the computing process. And that that matters not so much for your cell phone, but for your refrigerator being able to tell you you are out of milk, uh, your vacuum cleaner telling you that you need to change the bags, I personally don't want my vacuum cleaner talking to my refrigerator or anything else. They have no need to, but yeah. Um, and things like smart cars and smart cities. If this is correct, then there, once Huawei is in the network, it's not like right now with 4G, you can say the computers and servers and all that stuff have really, really high end antivirus, anti-malware, we're going to wall them off. And if you get in the cell phone, well, okay, you know, try not to do bank on your cell phone. But that distinction will go away with 5G. There was a very interesting article by some Australian analysts who pointed out something more fundamental. Um, who do you think maintains the IT network here at, say, Duke? It's not the IT department. The IT department will come in and change out your computer or your, your monitor and make sure there are updates. But you probably sign contracts with vendors to make sure that your overall equipment is constantly updated and kept modern. So if you buy it from Huawei, guess what? Huawei is responsible for going in and making sure everything is updated and upgraded, which gives it beyond admin level access. It's going to have to have that because you're not going to want to run software that's eight months old that has gaps in it. So Huawei into the networks does in fact pose a remarkably ugly challenge to the special relationship. The good news is coronavirus. <laughs> Why do I say that? <laughs> yeah, see? Well, see, sir, you said that you wanted me to keep things lively, so. Um, Coronavirus screws up global supply chains. Now, the bad news is it's screwing up Korean supply chains, too. But insofar as it is imposing a giant deadweight anchor on the seabed, I saw Titanic last night, um, and is therefore slowing down the ability of the Chinese to roll Huawei out everywhere, it buys time for various players, including the UK, to think about, is this really what you want to do? Now, the bad news here is that South Korea, Samsung, was the closest competitor to Huawei to being able to roll out a soup to nuts cell phone, base station, server router network that was single vendor integrated. That sort of screws up the competition aspect, but nonetheless, it does buy some interesting time for everyone to seriously think about what do you want 5G for? And why do you need it yesterday? Do you need it yesterday? Could, would it be such a terrible thing to maybe wait 12 months, see the system shake out? And now you have the coronavirus's supply chain impact to sort of add some additional reason for it. Before I ask Mike Schmidt for his opinion on whether China's redirecting the internet is lawful under international law, I'm going to take a question from the overflow room from uh, Captain Greg Spears of the Air Force. And Greg's, just a little background, Greg went to North Carolina Central University, but he took his national security related courses here at Duke Law, which is something we do in this area. If you go to UNC or North Carolina Central, you can take courses here. But Greg's question is, um, uh, he says, sir, can you speak to developments China is undertaking in building partnerships in South American countries? Is that a concern? So, yes and no. Um, and the same answer I would give for Africa, which is that China views its security like a matryoshka doll. Okay? Uh, it's, it's a nesting doll, so 
for the Russians. So the core most important things are what keeps the CCP in power and the inevitable threat to any government, most of all, is domestic instability, unrest, and illegitimacy. So coronavirus, bad. Um, protests, bad. Next is your borders. Taiwan, South China Sea, Xinjiang, Tibet. After that is the things that threaten those borders, the Central Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the supply lines. China is a net importer of energy, so supply lines to the Middle East, and food, interestingly. So supply lines to North America, Australia, Ukraine, and Russia. Places like South America and Africa are places that supply resources that keep Chinese factories running, are places that take Chinese investments of stuff, steel, cement, workers. So it's an important market. Um, it's a great political battleground in the sense of, again, since China's not particularly focused on alliances, it wants these places to vote with it at the UN. It wants them not to vote against China, such as on human rights issues. But I would suggest that as a security threat, you know, it is not at all clear that China is intent on creating a global network of military bases the way that we have seen with the Soviets, even now to some extent with the Russians, and certainly with the United States. Is, this a source of, is South America a source of concern? It should be for other reasons. One, I think the Chinese would very much like an economy of force option of keeping us focused on the Western Hemisphere while they do their thing in the Eastern Hemisphere. Um, there is a certain political tit-for-tat aspect here. The Chinese openly compare our behavior under the Monroe Doctrine with their behavior in the South China Sea. One important difference, however, being, um, well, on the one hand, actually, I guess we have toppled more governments in Central and South America than they have in Southeast Asia, so maybe not. Um, but um, to a large extent, it was keeping countries out from under the thumb of Europe, at least at the time of the Monroe Doctrine's declaration, whereas Southeast Asia is trying not to fall under the thumb of China. And the Chinese are saying, our Monroe Doctrine should allow us to keep these countries under our, our thumb. So the, there is that. Um, but again, please note, they've toppled fewer governments than we have. So, um, uh, But I would suggest that resource access and the ability to keep certain markets open may be a higher priority than a traditional military concept of threat. Mike, have you had a chance to contemplate the question? So I was going to ask what Zero was doing, that mentoring thing you asked me to do with young people <laughs> outside, so I can um, China seems to have redirected portions of global internet traffic to its into China by manipulating the border gateway protocols. This is something outlined uh, in a recent article by Demchak and Shabit. Um, to what extent is such redirection by technical means, meaning simply you know, sort of say, this is the fastest route, come through Beijing, um, it, to what extent is that illegal? It, it doesn't strike me as unlawful. Yeah. Not nice. No, no, no. Yeah. You ask a question about law. Right. Yes. No, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. See, he's a lawyer. Yeah. See, we're seeing all kinds of new things at this conference. A speaker asking the audience a substantive question, but that's that's the way we are, and that's what makes it so interesting. Um, from the uh, overflow room, and then we're going to take uh, some questions from here. Uh, Joe Barton from Washington Lee School of Law. Just a quick comment about Washington Lee. We weren't able to get them into the scholars program, but it's refreshing. They have a group of students that they brought down. It's on their spring break. That's the commitment that they have to improving themselves. So it's great to see. Joe, Joe asks, in a previous panel, it was mentioned that the Chinese are seeking to change the international membership on the International Court of Justice. What are your thoughts on this within the context of China's broader efforts to challenge international norms? The head of the International Civil Aviation Organization is a Chinese citizen. In their capacity as head of ICAO, they tried to ban Taiwanese journalists from covering open 
meetings on the grounds that there were already members of the Chinese press and Taiwan had no reason to send its journalists. The World Health Organization senior director is Chinese and up until a couple weeks ago blocked any effort to allow Taiwan even observer status within WHO on the grounds that China covers Taiwan. Um, Interpol has regularly refused, on the one hand, to grant uh, any kind of arrest warrants for people wanted in Taiwan. It says, we're more than happy to grab them uh, for you. Uh, but has you, again, the deputy director, until he was recalled and then arrested, um, the deputy director did, however, issue warrants for people like Uyghurs um, because they are automatically terrorists. Um, there was a Chinese interview with a senior UN official, again Chinese, uh, in Chinese, um, where he was asked about his behavior at the UN, and he said, oh yes, no, we had a meeting, I remember it well, uh, we had a Uyghur stand up and he tried to make some pro-independence comments, so I called the UN police in and they removed the individual. And it's like, and what happened? Well, my deputies tried to tell me that this was inappropriate, and I made it very clear that who were they to question my decisions? Because I will tell you that I am a Chinese official at the United Nations. And the audience, which was Chinese, stood up and applauded. So what does this suggest for the ICJ? Um, in my opinion, emphasize that, opinion, um, that is about as reasonable as China's effort to direct the World Intellectual Property Forum, which, by the way, they are currently in line to do. Um, this is beyond letting the fox into the hen house. This is letting the fox design the hen house and staff the hen house <laughs> and pick out which hens are going to be there on the night shift and the day shift. Um, do we think that Chinese lawyers are qualified to sit on the ICJ? I suspect they are. I suspect that they have probably read most of the articles written by the professors in this room because they're very good scholars. Okay? They do their research. The issue is going to be their legal reasoning. And coming out of a rule by law structure, being people who believe that they should are and should be Chinese officials at an international organization rather than international organization officials who happen to be from China, that you are going to wind up with very, very different results. Um, and I think that that should be very troubling. Interesting footnote to the reading of the articles. One of the things here at Duke Law is they put all your articles into the library into a database, and you can see on a monthly basis where your article is being downloaded. And you're exactly right. Thou just of mine, and I'm sure the more erudite of our professors, hundreds and thousands are being downloaded in China. Uh, really fascinating. Ma'am. Hi, Mr. Chang. Um, my name is Michaela Salamatin. I'm a second year law student at Vanderbilt. Um, I want to touch on this concept that you talked about with China redirecting internet traffic through, I guess, from other areas around the world. And I'm wondering if we're seeing any connection between it's a, China's ability to do this and the fact that China has been, uh, ch state-owned enterprises have been implementing uh, Chinese surveillance equipment in many countries. They've been training uh, officials in other governments, especially Venezuela, with how to use their surveillance technology. And I'm wondering if we're seeing any connections between uh, this digital authoritarianism and uh, this redirection of internet. Um, I have to admit that based on the articles that I've read, there's no direct connection I suspect that that's in part because of the sheer scale. I mean, when you're talking about 15 to 20 percent of global traffic, global traffic, over a two-day, two-week period, that's everything, right? That's everything from 
financial transactions at Citibank to business plans by Talos or Airbus to, I have this really cool cat video that I've been meaning to send to you guys. Um, so it's really cute, you'll love it. Um, I mean, it's all going into China. So, you know, is this tied to Hikvision or others doing surveillance? Hard to say. Um, one of the, you know, and to a large extent, that kind of data doesn't have to be redirected. Um, there was a panelist who was talking about drones. Uh, one of the largest drone manufacturers out there is DJI. It is a Chinese company. It's privately held. We have no real insight into what they do. But there have been some very disturbing reports. By the way, they make consumer drones. They're not doing like you know, predators and things. They're doing drones that you may well have at home. Um, apparently, those things, again, because of vendor ac access, they get updates. They also beam stuff back. And apparently, DJI drones, we think, may have been beaming everything back, like what it saw. Um, a couple of, about six months ago, there was an interesting report out of, I think it was Afghanistan, uh, where there were no American forces, but if you looked at Fitbits and things, they were all running these weird, there were these Fitbit patterns in Afghanistan around something that didn't exist. Uh, that was about at like a mile circumference. I mean, really weird. Um, so the interesting question becomes whether or not if you had enough DJI data from around the world, whether it was you and your you know, kids going out to the park, or the local sheriff department, or Marines in Afghanistan or Iraq, all using DJI drones, what kind of database you could assemble? And that's without redirection of data back. Show, retired Air Force Judge Advocate. Uh, question about the uh, arrest of the former Interpol official. Uh, was this a, do you think it was a legitimate uh, anti corruption effort? They just caught up with him, or was this an effort to assert control over him and remind other officials that of the long reach of the Chinese law? Uh, this answer is going to sound flip. I think the answer is yes. To begin with, I think it is a rare, rare Chinese official that has no corruption at all tainting their record. That they have never, ever accepted a single favor or done a single favor for anyone throughout their history. I, that, that person, uh, if the Chinese were Catholic, they should start canonizing these people, seriously. Um, they're about as common. Um, it, Xi Jinping is fascinating. He came to power in 2012. Previous Chinese leaders, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, also had anti-corruption campaigns when they started, usually petered out after about two to three years. Okay? Um, because anti-corruption, if everyone is corrupt, why am I prosecuting you and not you? Well, simple, because you're my political supporter, and that person obviously is a wretched criminal who deserves to be arrested. Um, but what we have seen under Xi Jinping is a constantly growing number of anti-corruption based arrests throughout their, at this point, eight year time in office. So I would suggest that many of these arrests are a combination. Some of these people are egregiously corrupt. When the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, the highest ranking military officer, has a, I kid you not, solid gold bust of Mao, that's like this big, on a general salary, there's some generals here. Um, I got one in my office. Oh, well, OK. Um, uh, you have to wonder where that money came from. And you know, especially for General Logistics Department, uh, and uh, you know, there was very blatant corruption. And uh, you know, so are these people, are some of them being arrested because they are corrupt beyond belief? Yes. Are some of them being arrested because, sure, they're corrupt, but also they're backing somebody else? Yeah, I think that's part of it. For this specific individual, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure that we will find out any time. Yeah, just to make the record clear, the gold bust is not a Ching Mao. It's of myself, so. <laughs> um, totally. Kara, and 
a word or two about uh, Kara. She was a student at Duke Law, and now she and her husband William, right there, are now Air Force JAGs down in San Antonio in different offices. Kara, what's your question? So you spoke a little Say bit. Your first full name. Oh, I'm. Because very few people can actually pronounce it correctly. I can. Alphabet soup is usually what I go by, but uh, I'm Captain Kara Iskandarian. He's May. It's easier. It's boring, though. Um, a question for you, sir. Um, you spoke a little bit about information warfare and information control. Has the Chinese experience, ongoing experience with coronavirus and controlling information related to it revealed anything about weaknesses or how they go about that practice domestically as well as internationally? Well, to begin with, I think you should probably talk to your counterparts um, in the intelligence community for a fuller description of, of both strengths and weaknesses. I think what we are seeing in the public domain is a couple of things. One, predating all of this is the fundamental reality. And again, this predates the creation of, this, of the PRC. Information has always been viewed as power. Therefore, information is typically given by titration, um, you know, literally one milliliter at a time, uh, because you don't give that up easily. EP3 incident 2001, I believe the record is pretty clear that the people at the air base where the Chinese fighter that collided with the EP3 were from had better information than the next layer up and the layer after that, much less what eventually wound up with Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin. Um, actually, I think Deng was there, sorry, just Jiang Zemin. Um, and this, I think, is fairly typical which is, before I pass information up the chain, I should probably figure out who would most benefit from getting that. Um, I think what we are seeing with the coronavirus is a couple of things. One, I don't think we, I th I'm not sure the Chinese have gotten their arms around it. So some of this is not deliberate badness, it's just foolishness, right? Um, this is a new virus. So how many cases were there in November and December? I'm not sure that they knew or that they knew what they were looking at. I'm not sure we would have known if something suddenly emerged in Iowa or New Mexico that had never occurred before. But I do think what we have seen since then with the muzzling of the Chinese doctor who tried to warn about this and who then subsequently died is a reflexive shutting down of information flow. When in doubt, limit and constraint. One of the most disturbing things from an international perspective has been the WHO. There is no evidence, I want to say, no evidence that the Chinese went to the WHO and said, don't declare a pandemic. But there does seem to be evidence that WHO was worried that if they did declare a pandemic, the Chinese might just say, well, since you're unfriendly, I'm not going to let your teams in to survey. So the Chinese like self-censorship. It's much more efficient. It's much more efficient for everyone in this room to question, should I say something, should I do something, should I publish something, than for me to walk around, I want to see what's on your computer and your phone and your tablet, because there's only so many hours in the day. So in a sense, Chinese information warfare has succeeded with WHO if they were going to self-censor. This also, though, highlights that in a choice between global goods and the CCP's legitimacy, reputation, et cetera, information flow clearly will be directed to support the latter rather than the former. And I would suggest that with no other major power, including Russia, that if you had something like novel coronavirus emerge, would you have a WHO hesitancy the way they did have with Beijing? We have time for one more question. Taylor, what, what was your question? Well, thank you very much for speaking with us today. I have a very general Dunlap style question. Um, for, all of, for all of us that are new to this industry and um, looking to learn more, do you have any books or articles that you would recommend for further reading? Learn more about what? Fair. That's a loaded question. Um, I would say generally China, international law, um, and the development of technology and how it's formulating law, 
or the or vice versa, how law, law is formulating technology or vice versa. Well, it's a matter of doing it. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So the first book that I always recommend to everyone, if they want to learn more about China, Asia, and things like that, is The Geography of Thought. I didn't write that. Um, George Nesbitt. Uh, he is a psychiatrist. Uh, he basically has looked at Asians and Westerners. And his point is, they look at problems differently. This is not the Kishore Mabubani argument, Asians are not ready for democracy. That's nonsense, OK? Japan, South Korea, Thailand. Rather, his point is, coming from a different culture, coming from a different milieu, they look at the world differently. And the real quick anecdote from his book is, I'm going to show a Japanese audience and an American audience a two-minute video of a fish tank okay, with a bunch of fish in it. And then I'm going to ask them to list the things that they saw. The Americans are like, well, there was this red fish over here, and it was circling, and there was this blue fish in the corner, and it seemed to be hiding in the treasure chest, and there was this orange fish over here. I think it might have been dead. It was kind of floating there. And the Japanese are like, well, there was this big group of fish over here on the left side of the tank, and I think there were like 20 fish over there, and there was this other group of fish in the upper right part of the tank. And then he asked each of the audiences if they had noticed what the other audience had seen. And in both cases, it was like, yeah, kind of, but it's hazy. So the Asians are noticing the broader context, and the Westerners are noticing the individual thing. Who's right? Both of them, because it's the same video, right? Who's better? Neither. They're different. But we need to be thinking about that when we engage these other people, this other civilization, this other group. Um, I will just say this about Cyber Dragon. For those of you who might be interested in it, it is based upon Chinese writing of how they view information, information warfare, not just cyber. Um, so the book itself, it's a textbook. Really, I think, pretty good if you're an insomniac. Um, so you know, if you can make it past two chapters, um, I think the publisher will like actually send you like night hall or something. Um, but uh, look at the footnotes. If you're if you're interested in that book, the footnotes do try to lay out what the Chinese are using are saying about information, including legal warfare and things like that, in their textbooks, in their encyclopedias, in their military journal articles. Um, and then one last item is uh, the Revolution in Chinese Military Affairs, which was an old, uh, it's about 15 years old at this point, but it marks the shift in Chinese military doctrinal thinking um, at a key point in the late 90s, early 2000s, when they shifted really away from numbers towards quality, and it did include um, a chapter in there on political war. Thank you very much. Like, like virtually all of our speakers, Dean's going to be around, and he's very graciously agreed to mentor, answer questions, whatever you might want. We have a couple of extra minutes on our break, so you don't have to be back till 1229. And so we will uh, so enjoy the extra minute and a half, uh, luxuriate in it, and we'll see you in 16 and a half minutes.